Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Stellarium show known as Summer Constellations. I'm Josh Rebels, Education Outreach Specialist at NASA's Ivy and Via Education Resource Center in Fairmont, West Virginia. And so today's session on Summer Constellations, I'm going to show you some star hopping techniques that you can practice using Stellarium and also outside in your, of your house real time this summer to help you find some constellations. And if you have a telescope, maybe I'll even share with you a few uh, things that you can try to find with your telescope. So we're gonna start this off by taking a look at what our sky is like the morning of our observing, anytime uh, during one of the summer months. So late May, June, July, August, these are constellations that are gonna become visible uh, just after the sun goes down and then are visible all night long. Uh, and so, uh, again, I mentioned we're here in the early morning, and I know that because the sun is beginning to rise over on the eastern side. And so, if you're going to do an observation somewhere for the very first time, you need to go out in the morning and figure out exactly where uh, the sun is coming up. Or think back to uh, the morning time when you saw the sun coming up which direction was it? That's going to help you figure out where the eastern horizon is. And so you'll notice then as I fast forward through time, you'll see how the sun kind of takes an angle towards the south as it's rising. And this is as seen in Fairmont, West Virginia, where I'm located at. So folks that are in the mid-latitude regions will see things like this when the sun's rising. And so that gives you a clue in which direction the south is. So it's going to move towards the south, southeastern side of the horizon, make its way across the sky, and in the evening it's going to set in the west. So you can see it coming from the southwestern side towards the western horizon where it will fall below the horizon at sunset. And so this helps you orient yourself with the directions uh, of your observation place. If you know where the sun rises and where the sun sets, you now know where uh, east and west are. In fact, I'm gonna turn off cardinal points, right? We, when you walk outside and you're observing, you're not gonna have the luxury of having those markers in your sky. Now, maybe you'll have a compass on your phone or you have mapped out with a compass earlier where, where those points are and, and you'll be able to use those as reference points. Of course, if you're using your phone out at nighttime, it's going to hurt your night vision. So I just recommend that you know what your, your cardinal points are ahead of time. And so by using that little trick, not only did I figure out where uh, east and west were, I know that this side of the, of the sky is the southern side because the sun came up and moved towards that side of the sky as it was rising and also came from it as it was setting. And so that means through process of elimination that this part of the sky over here is the northern part of the sky. And that's going to be important to figure out when you're observing all of your constellations because if you live in the northern hemisphere, the Big Dipper, which is an asterism within the Ursa Major constellation, is visible in the northern sky all the time. And so we start using that asterism as kind of our star hopping place for all of our constellations because it's always visible above uh, our horizon at nighttime. And it's made up of stars that are relatively bright and form a recognizable pattern, right? That looks kind of like a soup ladle in, up in the sky. And so that's easy to find for everybody. And so let's find our trusty Big Dipper. And so let's look towards the north. And we know the Big Dipper is very close to the Little Dipper, which contains Polaris, the North Pole star. So if we if we can uh, find it in this part of the sky, that's gonna help us out a lot. So let's go to a little bit darker time so that the stars begin to appear. So it's still setting, okay, there we go. We've got our first stars appearing. So if we look around it in the north, can you tell which star is the north star? Okay, and so there's a lot of bright stars here, and you're probably thinking, well, not really. This one could be the North Star, that one could be the North Star. Well, Polaris actually isn't the brightest star in the sky. Uh, and so just looking at the brightest star in the North is actually not gonna help you find Polaris exactly. So instead, let's keep looking for the 
uh, Big Dipper. And so here it is. This is a pattern that uh, you've recognized before. And so remember in the spring constellations video, we followed the arc of the Big Dipper to this bright orange star Arcturus uh, to find the constellation Boötes. And so this time we are going to do something a little different. Let's find the stars Merrick and Dubé. And so again, the stars of the Big Dipper are first here, the, of the handle is Alcade, which means the leading one. Remember that star is the hottest star that we can see with our naked eye. And then next to it is a group of stars named Miser. And then next to Miser, we have uh, Megrez. And then this star here, the first star that helps form the, uh, the bowl or the, the, the spoon part here, the ladle part of the, of the Big Dipper uh, is named, um, sorry, this is Megrez. I actually skipped one. This is Alioth. So we have Alcade, Miser, Alioth, Megrez is here. And then beneath Megrez, we have the star named Fad. And then across from Fad, we have our stars Merrick and Dubé. Okay. And so uh, in Stellarium, you can actually click on these stars to get their star properties. If you want to download Stellarium for free at stellarium.org, you can uh, do that and play around with it and practice some of your star hopping techniques. And so once we found uh, the Big Dipper and we know where Merrick and Dubé are, we're gonna find the North Pole with this trusty trick. So it's draw a line from Merrick to Dubé and continue through it until you get to the next bright star. And there it is. So this is Polaris, our North Pole star. Okay, and so from Polaris, uh, we're going to start our first summer constellation star hopping technique. We're gonna veer to the east. So if I go down to the horizon a little bit, remember this is the north, over here was the east, over there's the west. So from, from here, if I'm gonna veer to the east, I'm gonna look for Vega. And it's easy to find because it's the brightest star that's closest to the eastern horizon. So I'm gonna veer way down here to the east, that's Vega, it's gonna be a bright blue star. It's the fifth brightest star in the sky. And it's very similar to the sun, in fact. Close views of this star have shown a cloud of dust orbiting around it, much like our own solar system's matter orbiting around its sun. Due to the Earth's wobbling that occurs, Vega is actually predicted to be the new North Pole star in the year 14,000. And so here you can see uh, Vega is the brightest star in the constellation Lyra, which is depicted as a musical lyre, according to the Greeks' view of, of the sky. And so this lyre, according to uh, Greek myth, was created by Olympic gods and was played by Orpheus. Orpheus was uh, so talented that this lyre was gifted to him. And so his music that he played with this particular lyre created by the Olympic gods was so great that it had the ability to charm even trees, rocks, and streams of water. And the strumming of these magical strings was said to put even the dangerous sea sirens into silence. And it's probably the result of his charming music that he was able to convince the young female deity Eurydice into marrying him. Unfortunately, Eurydice was bit by a snake and it killed her. And so to save her, brave Orpheus went deep into the underworld with his lyre. There he planned to charm Hades with his music and allow Eurydice to return to him. And he granted him that and was successful in that endeavor with only one condition though. Upon leaving the underworld, Hades told Orpheus that he must not look back once. Of course, it was at the very end of this journey on their way out of the underworld that he glanced back to check on Eurydice which caused her to be left in the underworld forever. Orpheus spent the rest of his life playing his musical lyre and rejecting all marriage offers from any other woman. And so in June, uh, lyre is still close to the horizon uh, just after sundown, but maybe a bit higher in the sky and easier to see uh, if you are moving, uh, you know, 
late, if you're observing later in, in the summer. And so I'm gonna move forward in time a little bit. So your sky might look a bit more like this in June, July, and even higher, Vega will be in the sky moving into August, right? So also remember, as we go closer to the summer solstice, as I just changed the date and time, we'll see that it stays daylight longer. And so uh, you'll have to wait until later in order for it to become visible as all the stars in the background begin to appear as the sun starts setting. And so you can see how high up in the sky it will actually be. But you still just need to veer east from the North Pole star to find this bright blue star, Vega. Okay, try to find Lyra on a very clear night. And that's because if it's a very clear summer night, not a lot of clouds in the sky, you'll be able to, once you find Vega, use it to help you find the Milky Way. And so you can see it vaguely appearing now as it gets darker. There it is. So just beneath Vega is the Milky Way. And so this broad swath of stars kind of looks like someone took a paintbrush and smeared a line of stars across the sky. And so what we're looking at here is actually one of the neighboring spiral arms uh, next to the spiral arm that we live inside of, inside of our very own Milky Way galaxy. And so when you're looking at this very dense region of the Milky Way, uh, over near Sagittarius, over in this area, you're actually looking at the uh, very center of our Milky Way galaxy. Okay, and so our next constellation is depicted swimming through the Milky Way. And so to find it, we're going to start again at Vega, and then we're going to dive down into the Milky Way to find Deneb. So again, dive down into, to, into the Milky Way to find Deneb, and so here it is. And when you're looking at Deneb, you're actually looking at one of the furthest stars we can see at about thousands of light years away. Think about how bright and big this star must actually be for us to see it from that distance. The power of this star is impressive, just as impressive as the bravery and friendship in the Greek story of Cygnus. So the story goes, one day, two gods were having a friendly race across the sky in their chariots. So distracted by the spirit of competition, the two friends didn't realize how close to the sun they were racing. Their chariots started to melt and the friends fell from the sky. One landed in a river and the other landed on the ground. Seeing his friend drowning in the river, the one pleaded to Zeus for help as he started to dive down into the river to save his friend. Admiring the bravery and friendship on display, Zeus turned him into a swan, and he was able to dive to the bottom of the river and save his friend's life. Zeus was so amazed that when the swan died, he decided to place him into the stars to be honored forever. Okay, and so to help you uh, find Cygnus, of course, when you look up at the sky, you're not going to see the swan. You're going to be looking for this outline of stars, which is not going to be connected by lines. And so here's a little strategy to help you try to find it. So once you've found Deneb, you're going to try to draw a cross symbol. This is like the tail of the swan Deneb is. And so moving up, this is the longer part of its neck up to its head. And then from this bright star, which is named Sadir, uh, you can draw the draw the cross through to the wings. So this is the wings of the constellation. And so this little cross that I've shown you is actually an asterism, just like the Big Dipper is an asterism within the Ursa Major constellation. This is the northern 
cross, which is an asterism within the Cygnus constellation. And so once we're at Deneb, we again can actually move across to this star, Altair. And so remember, we'll dive down from Vega to Deneb, go across to Altair, and then back to Vega, you form this triangle. And so this is another asterism known as the Summer Triangle. And that will also help you find uh, the Milky Way as well, because it's this triangle is centered on the, the Milky Way spiral arm that we're looking at. And so Altair again is across from Deneb. So go across, from, across to Altair. And opposite of Deneb, Altair is actually one of the closest stars to the Earth at only a distance of 16 light years. This close distance helps the star become the 12th brightest star in the sky. So according to Greek myth, Aquila uh, is Zeus's eagle that carries around his thunderbolts. And so Aquila earned its spot in the heaven when Orpheus died. And so Zeus, who would call up Zuki, uh, call up Aquila anytime that he wanted to, you know, grab a thunderbolt from its beak and then launch it down uh, to the ground, he could do that. But Zeus then decided that there was another mission for Aquila one day, and so he sent Aquila to retrieve Orpheus's lyre after Orpheus had passed away and move it to the sky. And so uh, now all these constellations are honored in the Greek view of the sky. Okay, we're gonna end with one final constellation. Uh, one of my favorite constellations, it's named Hercules. And so I'm gonna remove our little aids here because Hercules is not as easy to find but I want you to have some experience trying to find this constellation uh, without the, all of this assistance. And so from the Summer Triangle, you can find Hercules if you start at Deneb and draw your line up through Vega and go back out of the Milky Way and just draw a straight line above the Summer Triangle up, a, up until you get to this figure here. It's not perfectly straight, but uh, you will find this trapezoid shape. This trapezoid shape is another asterism known as the keystone of Hercules. Now, you'll notice that these stars are not as bright as Vega, Deneb, or the other stars that we've been looking at. So it's going to be harder for you to find Hercules, but you wanna look for this keystone. That's gonna help you the most when you're trying to find it. Now, if you draw your line too far, what you'll do is you'll, you'll see this star Arcturus. Remember from the spring constellations, it's gonna be a bright orange. So if you can see that star, you've gone way too far past Vega. So it's actually in between Vega and Arcturus. And then you'll notice this little swath of stars here. This is actually, uh, another constellation. So if you've, if you've gone, if, if you've passed this, you're too far also. And so notice that I've already kind of lost track myself where the keystone is just by turning the screen a little bit. But here, here it is. Again, remember it's right there. And so Vega, Keystone, this next constellation, and then Arcturus. And so it's the Cor Corona Borealis constellation. It's, it's a crown. And then Hercules is here. So before we get to Arcturus. And so the keystone of Hercules is his body. And then these bent parts are his legs because he's usually shown like bent over, kind of wrestling something. Uh, and then above him here are his arms. And so uh, why is he always fighting monsters? Well, it was actually part of his duty of the 12 superhuman laborers. Hercules was the stepson of the very envious Hera, who would often torture Hercules. This drove him mad and caused him to lash out and hurt several people close to him. As a way to redeem himself, Hercules was ordered to complete all 12 superhuman labors, which included fighting the invulnerable lion, slaying the multi-headed hydra, 
and retrieving Cerberus, the three-headed guard of the underworld. Although he was the son of Almighty Zeus, it was actually his successful completion of these tasks is what earned him this spot in the heavens. And so one last thing, for those of you that have a telescope and want to try to find something neat with a telescope, if you look in this part of uh, Hercules, kind of on his side before, he, before his, his leg starts forming up here, uh, is a, a really nice globular cluster named M13 or Messe or object number 13. So I'm going to zoom in to this region. So here it is, kind of starting to appear where my cursor is. And so if you want to see something cool like this in your telescope, this is the Great Star Cluster of Hercules, or M13. And so uh, it is a globular cluster of stars that resides around our Milky Way galaxy. So instead of being inside of the spiral arms, it's above or below the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. And globular clusters just like these are thought to be the oldest stars that form as the Milky Way formed into a galaxy. So we're looking at some stars that are much older than the ones that uh, we see, you know, within our own spiral arm, you know, our sun itself. Okay, so. Hopefully you get a chance to try that out this summer and can take a look at it for yourself. Thanks for watching and tune in next time as we go into another set of constellations for the fall season.